Hello everyone, uh, this is a video for chapter number five in your book chapter uh, that we're gonna cover the uh, alternative techniques for classifications. If you watch the Weka uh, flow knowledge uh, video, uh, you notice that I made some kind of comparison between uh, different techniques uh, in uh, classifications. Uh, however, uh, we're gonna go now over the theoretical aspect of those uh, techniques. Uh, one of them is what is called rule-based classifier. And it's very similar to the decision tree that uh, we saw in our previous uh, chapter. And uh, sometimes, by the way, uh, they will generate generate the rules from a classifier made by the tree, by the decision tree. So, for example, here, uh, as you can see, we are making rules, a couple of rules, and maybe more, of course. For example, the rule number one: if the give birth uh, equal to no. Uh, for example, this is the attribute uh, give birth is no. So let's annotate those always this. and can fly the attribute which is can fly this uh, the third attribute uh, uh, is equal to yes this is one case two cases three cases and four cases so when we have this and relationship both of them they have to be uh, equal so if which as we can see here we have those cases uh, so it is no um, so we have this one here and the other case also no and yes so we have here and the last one So from this table, from this data, we were able to generate the following decision. So the rule says, if R1, uh, the, rule, the rule one says, if I have the attribute only give birth equal no, and the can fly equal yes. So the assumption is that the class value is birds. Very simple technique, and you can follow the rest of them. Uh, of course, some of the rules can cover most of the data, some of the rules cannot cover most of the data. So based on how much your uh, technique uh, that is relying on the rule base is sophisticated to cover all the rules, uh, to filter out the one that doesn't work. Uh, this is very similar, so you are looking, trying to, uh, to predict the class and accordingly you are looking at the rules and you can see from the rule number one that the class will be birds from the rule number three the class will be number for the second uh, instant so as i said it's based on how much accuracy how much coverage that you are uh, taking under consideration for example if you come up with a rule such as this one if the status equals single, which is the blue one, and so you are assuming automatically that uh, the class is null. Okay. So how much coverage we have? So as you can see here, is actually as accuracy is only fifty percent, and coverage from the data because how much instances we have here from the data that uh, is no one two three four five six seven and uh, actually you covered uh, two and if we measure the complete coverage so almost 40 percent of the data is covered by this tool so technically is is not a good assumption just to run the rule base for one uh, one fold you have to run it more than one fold to be able to uh, estimate uh, the real value or the uh, the real classifier that's why sometimes we found in our Wika we have misclassified uh, instances in the classes 
because based on how much uh, your technique is looping and uh, repeating and to find the best solution that can cover all the data. And here uh, some of the uh, things that you can see, uh, for example, uh, one of the rules here that uh, there is uh, none of the rules can cover it, which is the last one. Uh, so this is one of the uh, side effects, uh, trade-off of using the rule-based classifier. If the rule is covered, you will be able to, uh, like for example, the R3 is classified uh, from the rule 3, you can get the value of the first uh, prediction for the value, for the uh, instance, the following instance. Uh, for the second one, we notice it covers in two rules, so that means uh, we have two values, so we are here in, in, in a very bad situation. We don't know which one we're going to pick. The worst one is the last one, that we don't have any rule at all for this one. Now, uh, I want to justify here that there is two different types of uh, the rule-based classifier. Some of them rely on decision tree to generate the rules, and some of them, they just are indirect. Well, uh, what we say like uh, would go directly and uh, uh, like uh, will generate the rule by itself. So for here for example we noticed the decision tree before we are familiar with uh, such a diagram and what we are doing we are just uh, coming up with the rules based on the decision tree. So if I give you decision tree like this, I tell you, okay, generate the rules for me, you should be able to do something like this. So for example here, if the refund equal yes, we are looking at the node. Uh, and as you can see, this is uh, the, the end of the tree, the blues, those are uh, the leaves of the tree. Uh, so those nodes are considered decision. So if the refund is yes, uh, so the, uh, the, the, the if the attribute refund equal yes, so the class is no. Uh, here, to get this one, for example, uh, refund is no and uh, the margin status is merit, then that's equal to no, and etc. So you can generate all the rules if you build the decision tree. But as you can see here, you have two steps. Uh, this is the one that simplified one that we saw that is not uh, completely covered and uh, so rules can be simplified uh, for example uh, i have the initial status uh, the refund is no and status uh, is married so the class is no however if i pick only the married okay i will say it will also give me no so this is more simplified i don't need really uh, to consider uh, uh, to consider the the other value is not uh, uh, is not important. So as I was saying, we have two types of uh, rule-based uh, classifier. Uh, so we have the direct one, and the most popular is the Reaper. And we're going to look at it. The other one, uh, which is indirect, that means it gets the decision tree. And uh, so uh, first we create the decision tree, and based on it, uh, or neural network based on it, they will generate the uh, rules such as C4.5, which is I, uh, we, uh, we saw it before and uh, it's really popular and it works very well. Of course, since it works, it needs more time to, to be executed. Now, of course, there is a metric to decide if your uh, uh, rule based is working fine or not. Uh, three very popular metrics, uh, one of them is the accuracy, so uh, you are dividing the number of instances that are covered by this rule or the number of instances not covered by the rule, this is one. La Laplace, which is very popular also, uh, a little bit variation uh, from the previous one, we are adding one uh, to the number of instances uh, covered by the rule and we are dividing it to the number of instances uh, covered by the rule uh, summed to the number of classes. Uh, the M estimator, uh, it worked really good uh, in the uh, recent years, especially in two different domains, uh, very popular in the text uh, 
mining and uh, for classifying text and for bioinformatic gene algorithms. So a little bit different variation you can see uh, in this one. Uh, so it, it depends on you the type of the data you work on. Uh, if your data is very simple data, usually most of the uh, researchers use accuracy as a measurement. And we saw it in our, uh, we can generate the accuracy. So some summary about the direct method. Uh, so you, you grow a single rule, then you remove instances from the rule, as we saw when we picked only four. Then we prune the rule if it's necessary when we took off, uh, for example, the refund attribute. Uh, either you add uh, new rules to the current set and you keep repeating. So that's it. It's a loop until you find the best uh, outcome. And of course, there is a, a way to break the loop, which is uh, maybe your measurement, the accuracy. If it reaches this point, it's enough for me, satisfied. Or if I find that the accuracy is not changing after a couple of repetitions, so I will stop there and I will say that's enough. Uh, and this is a repair uh, algorithms, and you can read it in details. If you have two class problems, what you do, and if you have more than a uh, multi class problem, uh, it's so the same technique the repetition and the stopping uh, and how you treat the rules in details. Now, the indirect, which is uh, one example, the C 4.5, the indirect method first you build your tree, so you have the decision tree running as a classifier first, and accordingly, you run your rules. Uh, so from here, P equal no, so we're going like this, Q equal no, so the class is minus, and you can try all the rest of them. Uh, what uh, distinguishes, it's the same concept, just uh, that we are extra extracting first uh, the decision tree, and uh, according to the decision tree, we are making our assumption and we are building our rules and we are comparing until uh, and we are repeating until we no longer we find any improvement uh, in our uh, error or the opposite. Uh, the accuracy is not increasing. This is a simple data set. And this is a comparison between both, so you can you can see you will end up with two different type of rules if you are using the C4.5 or if you are using the refer. So, so really, it is uh, uh, it's it, it, you know it's it's based on the data and it's based on uh, how well each one of those works on your data and how much time. Uh, your considering is important. So try to follow the decision tree uh, and apply it on the C4.5 where the ripper is automatically build the rules step by step and it doesn't come from the decision tree. And try to make a comparison between those two algorithms. And as you can see, the outcome could be to totally different. And you'll see it in the second slide. So in those two comparison, uh, this is the actual class, like uh, this is what it should be, where the predicted class uh, that this classifier come up with uh, give us the following result. So for example, here we can see pure class. The second one, we have one misclassifier. Here we have one misclassifier. We take the lower number that is a misclassifier. We always consider the big one that is the most likely that this is a real classifier. And uh, in this case, uh, is one is outside. Uh, the mammals, it was the right answer. So we have six of them. They were classified as mammals, and we have one of them is wrong. Okay, so here the same words, it was the predicted value and it was right as a bird, one of them was wrong. Uh, in the reptile, for example, three of them were right and one of them was an outlier. The first one completely, it was an accurate prediction. If you use a reaper on this specific data, and as I said, it's data dependent, the actual value of the class and this is the projected and you can compare between both and you can tell me which one based on those numbers is better than the other 
and uh, you can see for example here uh, it should uh, the actual class should be uh, amphibians and it predicted as a mammals here and so it's completely wrong uh, the second one it was a fish and uh, uh, what happened here is fish so the prediction was right reptiles reptiles three however we had one misclassification in the birds okay we have uh, two birds but we have this is wrong and this is wrong and the mammals we have only four where the other two are wrong so based on what you see here you can tell me which one worked better than the other so some kind of advantages as a summary of rule based uh, it is uh, highly expressive as decision tree, easy to interpret, easy to generate, can classify in instance, instances rapidly, like if it's uh, your data, you generate your classifier from a previous uh, data, then you add it to new instances, will not take longer time to predict the classifier for those instances. Performance compared to decision tree, uh you know it's it's very close to it uh, it's not so big difference so they are both from the same family another very uh, close related uh, type of technique is instance based classifier so you build your classifier based on instances we're gonna not talk a lot about it but the main idea that you have uh, road learner and uh, the one that is very very important is the nearest neighbor and this is the one that we're going to talk in detail um, which is the k nearest neighbor and we're going to show you how it works uh, so the basic idea if it walks like a dog it walks like a dog then it's probably a dog so this is a simple uh, expression so you can always remember what is the nearest neighbor classifier Okay, so let's say I have, uh, this is this one, I want to test uh, this uh, instance. So I will try to see which one of those is the nearest uh, to me. And I can pick the k equal, if I pick k equal 1, so the one which is nearest to me is this one. If I pick 2, uh, so those two are the nearest one. If I pick a 3, as a distance, those are the, the 3 closest to me. So here the distance play big role. Okay. So this is the way it works. Uh, I start from nowhere. Uh, I drop a point in my uh, data set, in representation of my data set, and then I decide how much uh, the k equal. So the main problem is to decide how much uh, neighbors of the data is surrounded by my starting point and also the starting point is very important sometimes the algorithm repeat over and over by uh, resetting the starting point and if you get better results from one starting point like the starting point from here uh, accordingly you may uh, change the result of your classifier here the k equals 3 as you notice so build a classifier based on three instances close to the beginning node. I'm going to talk more about it. It's like kind of voting. Uh, and as you can see how much it is different based on if I'm looking at one nearest neighbor. So my point is starting from here. Give me the first nearest neighbor. So my, uh, my boundary is this however if i pick two nearest neighbor now my boundary is expanding it's bigger if i pick a three this is my boundary and uh, as you can see there is some problems can appear in this kind uh, very popular uh, to map the one nearest neighbor to something called uh, Voronoi diagram because you are uh, as if you are putting each data point in its own class. The measurement used to, uh, to find the distance is Euclidean distance. We are familiar with this equation, with this formula. 
So the Euclidean distance between two points is the square root of the sum uh, of uh, the square uh, of uh, the uh, uh, subtraction of the point, the first point from the second point. I was going this before. And there is some kind of weighted factor which is equal uh, to the inverse of the square of the distance between those two points. So it's some kind of voting. Uh, what kind of uh, problem that can appear with nearest neighbor? If I pick the k, that's the number of data that close to the point that I am starting with is very small, is very sensitive to noise point, which means to the point that uh, are outliers maybe. And if I pick very big, the neighborhood may include points from other classes. So those are very, very typical problems with nearest neighbor. And of course, there is some kind of trade-off in every algorithm. And scalability also is another issue. So the attribute may have to be scaled to prevent distance measure from being dominated by one of the attributes. So if one of the attributes, it, uh, it has uh, influenced most of your data, this attribute will take over the majority of your decision of the classification. And uh, that fall into the concept that we talked uh, a little bit about uh, previously, the curse of dimensionality. That if you have a, a very high dimensional data, that means I have a lot of attributes, thousands of attributes. We didn't see something like this so far. Uh, then it's very difficult for you to use a nearest neighbor because it's very you cannot uh, really intuitively find the results if you classify. <clears throat> Sorry. We passed. So, okay. So, K nearest uh, neighbor classifier are lazy learner. So, you remember this term, that means it takes time. Uh, it does not build model explicitly. Unlike eager learners such as decision tree induction and role based system, classifying unknown records are relatively expensive because you have to re go back and reclassify all your data again. If you add one data into your one instance in your data, you have to go back and reclassify everything from the beginning. So remember the summary. Another type of uh, classification, Bayesian. Uh, based uh, and uh, don't get scared by those formulas I'm gonna explain them uh, so the Bayesian base will say the following this attribute is most likely will be in this class if the probability <coughs> if the probability of this attribute to belong of this class divided over <clears throat> sorry, the probability of uh, that attribute in general. And usually uh, also uh, they switch the term to make it easier. So let's go to the theorem in general. The probability of an attribute A to be in class A, uh, we don't know it and this is uh, the mystery. We don't know if this uh, instance is belonging to that class or not. <coughs> Uh, so what we do, we do the opposite. We first uh, we look at the uh, at the class uh, and we'll see how much attributes we have in this class. We multiply it by the probability of that specific class or the probability of that attribute. We're gonna see examples that clarify uh, that uh, concept. Let me pass this one and maybe from the data set it will be more uh, easier for you. So. So how we can estimate, for example, uh, let's say that uh, probability for the class. First of all, you are calculating the probability of your class. How many, how many values we have? We have the no. So we have seven elements of no. And how many total? We have 10. So those are 10 instances. So the probability to have no as a class is 7 over 10. How much probability of yes? We have a 3. So the probability of the yes is 3 over 10. Okay. 
Now, if I want to search for a specific attribute from here and see the probability of that attribute, so it's the probability of the status equal married that to be belonging to a class, no, how much it is. So what I'm, I'm doing here, I'm looking at the attribute, which is this one, and I'm looking at the status of married. So one, two, three, and four. Okay, and how much those as attribute based on the merit and I wanted to, to test it on no. How much of those the status is no is equivalent? Yes, here is no, here is no, here is no, and there is no. Okay, so and we know the probability of no in total is seven. Okay. So technically, four from the no's out of the seven, this attribute fit as a probability. So I have four over seven. So I will repeat. We know the probability of no that equal seven over 10. So we have seven cases of those instances that the probability is no. So seven times no is, is as a situation where the class is no. How much of from this attribute that four of them are married that fit the seven? We have four of them that are fitting the seven. So my probability that, uh, that when the status is married, to go into the class equal no, like I will judge that if that attribute is married, and from the beginning I will say, okay, the class is no, is four over seven. However, what, how much is the probability of the refund equal yes and the class equal yes? Okay, where is the refund? This is a refund. If it's yes, as you can see here, is no. So this is not fitting. Yes is no yes is no so the probability is zero completely i know we we most of the students they don't like statistics they don't like probability but the concept is very very simple just if you grasp it and you apply it on numbers okay now we can solve the problem that uh, if we have a continuous attribute and we talked about this before uh, by discretization and uh, also by two-way split or probability density estimation. And we're going to see a little bit of that in the following slide. Now, uh, we don't have a problem with this one because this is uh, uh, can be easily solved, yes, no problem. However, we have a probability with the following data that are continuous data okay in this case we have to use some kind of normal normal distribution uh, and uh, so the probability here of a specific attribute to belong to specific class is uh, calculated by using the normal distribution so technically let's get an example and i said it's easier to see it by example so for, for the case of probability that uh, the, the attribute when it's equal to 120 to belong to class no, like if the salary is 120, like in this one, I want to see if the class will be no, how is this can be calculated. And since this is an attribute uh, is a continuous attribute, so you are applying the uh, following equation you calculate the mean of this data so you calculate the mean of this one and the variance of this one and you just apply the formula one over the square root of two pi uh, multiplied uh, by uh, square root of uh, uh, square root of uh, the standard deviation okay so and then uh, e to the power of the attribute by itself here in our case the attribute is 120 which is the value we are looking at uh, minus uh, the mean of our data for all this data uh, which is equal the 110 
and then divided over 2 multiplied by uh, by a standard deviation uh, to be squared standard deviation which is the variance okay and the, uh, the value is this one I'm not going to ask you to do something similar, but just I'm showing you that there is a solution uh, for also uh, values that are continuous, and the program will handle it by itself. We can SAS, uh, any kind of application you're using, will be converting this data for you. And you can try those examples uh, easily, like if you have uh, this, you are trying to see uh, what kind of uh, class uh, will be belong? So I may ask you something like this. Uh, okay, if I have the following class, where do you think uh, this is will be fitting? Uh, so I have refund equal no. The merit is this, uh, the attribute. The income is one twenty. So if it's equal to the no, so you you have to apply for each one of those attributes. If uh, refunds is no, the class is no, so you are starting with class no, all of, all of them is no, and you are calculating for each one of them, so this is 4 over 7, uh, for the second attribute, uh, the merit is 4 over 7, for the income is the one that we just calculated, and this is the result. Uh, if the class is equal yes, we are applying the same method and uh, we notice that uh, the value is equal to zero so most likely as you can predict from here uh, that uh, the, the destination will be the class is equal to no so based on this instances uh, the, the, the class will be no based on what we have as a result from previous data that we saw of course, also we have some kind of measurement or, or estimator to, to predict our uh, accuracy. Uh, as we saw, the accuracy or the original dynamic here, or Laplace or M estimator, and this is similar to what we saw before. Uh, you, another example, if you want to predict the value of this one, and this one is a little bit simpler because we don't have any continuous data here. Uh, so, for example, I have an attribute A and I want to know is it mammal or it's not mammal. So, the so probability of that attribute to be mammal or to be not mammal. So, what you do, you look at the data and you see, okay, for uh, each column. Uh, so, how, how many from here, uh, if it's mammal, it's yes, uh, so you, you, you calculate uh, each attribute of those. Uh, so you look at the results and you map it. So as, as yes, we have one here, two, three, four, five and six I have I missed this one seven one of them is no so the percentage is six over seven but the value yes and you repeat the same for each attribute and you calculate those you may come up with this number now you repeat the same for the non mammal and you look at the attribute for each one of those four and you come up with this number. Now, however, you need to calculate the probability of the mammal in general. So how many instances of those that we have here, 20 instances, how much the mammal is repeated is seven over 20. So seven K instances we had mammal, uh, whereas non-mammal we have 13 over 20, always the sum of those two should equal the the complete instances number. Uh, so as you can notice from here, the value of this one is much bigger than the value of that. So in this case, you say the value here is mammal. Sorry, the writing is not so good with this tablet, but I think you got the picture. And 
this is easier to be asked instead of using some continuous value. So as a summary, a naive base is considered as very robust to isolate noise point. That's why is uh, is considered very good in data that might have a lot of noise. Uh, it handles missing value by ignoring the instance during probability estimate calculations. Uh, robust is a relevant attribute, so it's not uh, dependent on the attribute. Independence assumption may not hold for some attributes. Uh, we always naive base. This is the basic assumption. Uh, let's go to the slide that I passed. Naive base or uh, conditioner base always hold the uh, the following assumption that uh, that the attributes uh, are independent from each other so when you calculate the probability you are multiplying all the attributes with each other because you're assuming that uh, uh, there is no relationship between the attributes which is not true always okay so but most of the uh, like 90 percent of the applications that you see using probability uh, naive uh, probability uh, or based uh, or conditional naive probability will rely on the concept that they are uh, separated from each other. So usually what you do, you get the multiplication of this. So you always assume the independence among, among the attributes. Otherwise, all our work here will not work. But in general, uh, we say there is a uh, to make our life easier, we consider that the probability is uh, the independence is is based is uh, considered, so we don't have problem. Artificial neural network is one of the most famous. Also, the one I showed in Wika. Uh, also, it takes a lot of time, as we noticed uh, in our full knowledge video, because it needs to calculate uh, calculate everything over and over and over again so you consider it as if you have a black box you have an input which is those attributes that we are calculating and we are trying to predict the class and it use some kind of uh, uh, of uh, uh, of a layer uh, multiple layer sometimes not only one layer so this is one layer you may have it more and you sum up based on some kind of constant value and uh, you divide it over weight and all this work automatically in your system but this is the concept it's like the neural network like if you have an assignment and you are thinking uh, is not one neuron in your brain is working uh, hundreds of thousands of neurons split the job until they found the answer for you so this is the same concept that was really really uh, famous in the artificial intelligence domain it was like a breakthrough uh, in the 80s and uh, that uh, something like magical happened by using the artificial intelligence uh, so this is with uh, hidden layer so this is more uh, like we can understand it more you have all those attributes and then all of them will go to a middle layer so you can see the split of the value of all until you get after with the best solution for your decision uh, the the mix of distributing the work into many different uh, uh, middle layer that's the power of the uh, neural network and there's a function and there is a threshold that uh, we mentioned before and that always is based on the function that you are using and based on the application it works really amazingly it works really really good now the one that i am very uh, used to which is support vector machine because this is really really good especially in splitting the data uh, let's say you have this the following data and i want to split the data that is support vector machine that uh, create a vector for me to split my data uh, so this is maybe the best cut however there is uh, another cut maybe this one also works uh, and all those can be considered as a support vector machine uh, splitting data as a vector splitting 
Uh, however, the the problem here appears that which one is the best. Uh, as much as there is a bigger distance between uh, the two set is the better. Here I have a smaller distance. Uh, so uh, B1 is better than D2 is considered because uh, and, and you start by defining your middle point by defining the line. Then you say, okay, I have a lower boundary and I have a higher boundary, which is uh, just uh, upper one by one, lower one by minus one. And the margin will be uh, the sum of uh, the distance or the width uh, of this one uh, inversed and multiplied by two because we have so, two distances. Um, so this is what we say. Now, what the problem that can happen here, like uh, when you do some kind of split, some of, of the data may be merged in between. So this is the typical problem when uh, your uh, is not your uh, your vector is not linearly separable. Uh, you cannot, you know, you need some kind of splitting your data somehow like this. If you can imagine it like this is really my first class and then the second class would be something similar to that one this is my second class okay. so there is no linear separable capability in my data and that's a problem in support vector machine however there is a way to solve that problem okay so this is one example that if you so in this case you have to think about different dimension and to move to the higher space this is a good way but it's not linear se uh, separator uh, so you solve your problem on higher dimension and uh, to be able to do this so you are moving to a different uh, dimensional space so instead of having x1 x2 you come up with an equation that really you can move to the hyperplane that can separate your data from one sorry from one place to other place and that is very typical and very known but time consuming of course uh, there is one uh, last method that I'm going to mention here, not in detail, uh, the ensemble method that uses multiple uh, ways of classifier, more than one type of classifier uh, to solve your problem. So you have your original data here, and then what you do, you create multiple data sets, you are splitting your data into multiple data sets, and then you apply different kind of classifier on each one of them and then you combine all of them uh, it was uh, very uh, criticized in 1990s uh, assembly method however it proved that it works very well because uh, some data uh, really if there is no interrelationship in those data uh, you will find that it works very fine and as if you are chunking the information into multi-different level and the technique that usually use is the bagging and the boosting and if you want to read more about this one let me know send me an email and i will send you more information about it that's it for the theoretical part uh, in this unit we are done with uh, unit six completely uh, and this is what you would be uh, asked for for the test number one and then of course for the project that's following test number one uh, all those units will be uh, considered as a building blocks for you uh, in the data mining. Uh, try more to, to apply those kind of techniques that we saw here in the Wika, in the knowledge flow. Uh, you will be more seeing the result in, in practice and it will be more exciting for you. And uh, that's it. I wish you all the luck.